still alive. I've got a bloke here who I have admired forever. I've had the opportunity to become very close mates with him over the years as well. Michael Holding will be revealed. <laughs> there he is. Mikey, thanks for joining us. I was looking to see who you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Mikey, you still love the game. I mean, you, you, you bring for a sure. new dimension to us on Super Sport, and that's something we appreciate, but I know you really enjoy doing it. Yeah, I enjoy the game. I enjoy talking about the game. I enjoy the job that I do, Hazy. You know, I also enjoyed my career. I had 12 years of the best I could ever think of us playing for the West Indies. We were very successful. We went around the world. We enjoyed each other's company within the team. We made other people happy. So what not to like? And a successful, very successful unit as well. Yes, very successful team. You know, we had a lot of greats within that team. And I look at that team and I think it must have been a great team for the number of members of that team who are now in the Cricket Hall of Fame. Usually you find people going into the Cricket Hall of Fame over an extended period. About five or six from that team went into the Hall of Fame almost immediately. I want to know, right, let's get stuck into this. I want to know how, how did the whole West Indies fast bowling era start? There's a little story about that which suddenly shook things up, shook the world of cricket up. Well, the four-prong pace attack, yep. I think is what you're referring the, to. Because, the fearsome foursome. Yeah, because we have had some great fast bowlers in the past. You know, yep. But 1975, 76, we went to Australia yep. and we were bombarded by good fast bowlers and not just good fast bowlers, but terrorizing fast bowling. A lot of the guys got hit, that sort of a thing. By? Well, you had Lily, you had Thompson, you had Lenny Pasco. Max Walker wasn't that quick, yep. but he was one of one four prong. And then you had a fellow by the name of Gus Gilmore, who, who, played, who played as well. So Australia had five men there that could run in and bowl and, bowl and terrorize the opposition. Well, when we came back from Australia, 76, we played India at home. And we set India a big target in Trinidad of 400 odd runs that everyone thought, OK, we'll win this test match easily because we have two spinners in the lineup. And they say, in Trinidad, you play spinners, the spinners will bowl out the opposition. Well, they didn't quite bowl the opposition out, here. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I think India lost something like four wickets. One of them was by the, the run-out route. Oh, <laughs> so the combination of what our experience in Australia, plus what happened in Trinidad when we picked the two spinners, I think Clive Lloyd decided, hey, this ain't going to work. We're going to pick our best four bowlers. If our best four bowlers are seamers, if they are spinners, whatever they are, we'll play them. It just happens at that time we had a lot of fast bowlers. So he selected four fast bowlers going through the rest of that series and, of course, continues with, with that and we know what happened. OK, so the four, the four fast bowlers, just name the, the assassins you had with you? <laughs> well, the original four prong, we, at that stage, yes. we, ha we had people like Van Burn Holder, yes. who went to England in 76, Keith Boyce, who was playing around that time. But the original four prong pace attack that everyone talks about constituted Andy Roberts, Joel Garner, Colin Croft and myself. Then Malcolm Marshall joined in afterwards and they came up left because he was a senior man. He was the lead of the attack initially. He was a senior man when he dropped out. Malcolm Marshall came in so that then filled the, 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 four, the four again. But the original four was with Andy as the head man. Oh, they call them the, the, the Acropolis horsemen. That was, the, that was the, the term I think was going around as well. Well, we didn't pay attention to too okay. much of the talk. Okay. We just wanted to go out there and get the job done. I want to show our viewers Michael Holding steaming in here. Now, this is some footage in Australia, and I know for a fact that Mike used to enjoy bowling in Australia. This is uh, back in 84, 85. Mikey, so this is, I used to enjoy going there because of the surfaces. Well, the pitches in Australia were e extremely quick, extremely bouncy, so any fast bowler going to Australia would always enjoy bowling in Australia. I think that is why they took me there for, for the very first time. My first tour was Australia 75, 76, because they figured that that place would encourage fast bowlers. But I'll give you a little story about that performance. I think that is Perth. I'll give you a little story about, about that performance. I was not supposed to take the new ball in Perth. As a matter of fact, Joel Garner and Malcolm Marshall were, were bowling. And There's Mako. Yeah, Malcolm Marshall. Yeah, and... Uh, oh, hang on, holding, taking that catch as well in the gully. That's yeah, another side we've got to took remember. A catch every now and again. Okay, back to your bowling. <laughs> but I think Bird was running against the wind. And Bird said to Lloyd, no, he doesn't want to run against the wind. So after, I think, one over, possibly two overs, Lloyd put me on the switch around. He didn't get the ball back. <laughs> <That was a laughs> I think Australia made 
71 yeah. or something like that. Bowled out. Malcolm and myself bowled them out. So Bird didn't see the ball again. What about the 80, uh, 75 in Australia was your were your first tour, first selection to Australia? Yeah. And I understand that the, you were a little bit concerned about going on that tour. What was that reason? Well, you, what you have to remember here is the 75, I was 21 years old. Yep. I just started playing cricket at the high, not the highest level, at J Jamaica level, first class cricket. I played a few President's Lem games, that sort of thing. And I wasn't even thinking that I'd be going to Australia. But I'd heard some rumours, oh, they might take it to Australia. But I wasn't thinking about that. I was at my club, Melbourne Cricket Club. As you know, Melbourne relates again to Australia. And a friend of mine came upstairs where I was sitting down watching the game and said, Mikey, they picked you for to go to Australia because you know those days you didn't get, a, get any official notice from the, the selectors. You never get a telegram. He never got a letter. It was just a matter of hearing it on the radio. So he rushed up to tell me that he had heard it on the radio. And he perhaps thought, oh, Mike, he's going to be so happy. Let me give him this news. <laughs> and I did not react. And he thought, what's wrong here? Because I didn't react because I was not that enamored about the entire prospect. Not that I didn't want to play for the West Indies, but we were going to Australia in November which meant you're going to be away from home for Christmas. Right. And I was still living with my parents, and Christmas in Jamaica, especially with your family, was such a joyous occasion. You look forward to Christmas every year. And I was going to miss Christmas at home this year, but I got over it. I was going to say, it worked out all right for you. That was OK. <laughs> right, let's get into... I'm going to show some footage shortly about uh, the Oval in 76. Yeah. Before we get to that footage, I just want to show... Just tell the story about what was the motivation before your 14 wickets at the Oval, and, of course, for the entire team during that series? The entire series, yeah. Um, I think everybody heard about Tony Gregg making that statement about he was going to make the West Indies grovel. And I think that just got up everyone's back. Not everyone actually heard it live, because those days you didn't have a television set in your room. You had to go downstairs in the hotel to watch whatever was being shown on BBC or, or I think they had three stations then, BBC One, Two and ITV. And some of us heard it because we were watching the game that was being broadcast on the Sunday because we didn't play cricket on a Sunday as a touring team. And some of us heard the comment and related it to everyone else. And that had everybody, everyone's back up. And for the entire tour, every time Tony Gregg came to the crease, the fast bowlers bowled a little bit quicker. And the English batsmen who were there with him cursed him every time, said, why do you have to say something like that? You know, we are feeling the brunt of it as well. But that, 19, that 1976 test match at the Oval, we had moved on from that in a, to a degree in that, yes, there were already four test matches, but this was now a test match where we could cement our position and say, yes, we are going to win this series convincingly. We, won the, we were leading 2-0. And when it got to that test match, it was a very flat pitch, and most of the guys are senior guys. And the Roberts Van Burn holder, they have been around a long time, and they saw the pitch. It was almost a situation like what we're facing with here today, when the series already won, and there isn't a lot going on. The pitch is flat, so not a lot of enthusiasm from the senior guys. Well, me, young kid, I just wanted to run in and bowl fast. I started off well, started getting some wickets, and I just kept on running in and kept on getting wickets. And that's the thing that I heard from a lot of people and, and just doing some research on this. I mean, people were saying that you took the pitch out of it totally because it was so slow. You didn't need the pitch. And I think our viewers all just watching the, the you glide in there and bowling at that pace. I mean, it just comes out of that television screen, the, 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 the fastest that you did bowl in that series. When was your quickest year? Do you remember whether you reckon you, when you were at your Oh, fastest? that's hard. That's hard. But I think I bowled my fastest in Australia because, as we know, here's it, the pitches encourage fast bowlers. So you run in and bowl fast on pitches that encourage you to bowl fast. So I think I bowled my fastest in Australia. And I can remember an over I bowled in Perth. Yes. I got rid of Rick Darling, Greg Chappell in the same over. I think it might have been two balls on the track. It was. And then Alan Border came yes. out. And Alan Border I glanced the ball off his helmet before he actually moved out of his crease. Out of his stance, rather. And he quickly looked away from me as, as if he didn't want me to realise that he was a bit shaken. So, Perth, Australia, any fast bowler who wouldn't bowl fast there has a problem. That was 1981, and Alan Border told me that was the only time throughout his entire career that he thought that if he didn't get in the right position, that you'd actually might totally clean him up. It's the only time <laughs> he really thought a bowler could actually take him out if he well, got it. Quickest pitch in the world, you know. He said that early morning sheen on it as well, as well. Right, let's go back to uh, 76. Uh, some body yeah. blows for Brian Close. Gee, he took some nasty ones. Um, I think that was. 
Old Trafford, I think it was. Was it? Okay. Yes, I think it was Old Trafford. It wasn't the best pitch in the world yeah, at Old Trafford. And some of the balls were taken off from a pretty good length. As you notice there, he's been hit under the armpit, just above his waist, that sort of a thing. Those were not short balls. If they were banged into the pitch, they would have gone over his head or gone shoulder height. And the, the regulations that they have currently in place, the umpire would not have had to say anything to me. And by the way, th that picture that you're looking at there, that is not me. That was from Wales Hall. That was holding, getting struck there. You, you're talking about the photographs of, uh, of all the bruises on Brian Close's body. And, and Brian Close. Those pictures that they show, yep. they show that in the, in the documentary yes. as well. F fine Babylon. Fine Babylon, yep. I think they used a little bit of artistic license to bring those pictures together and, and say it was 76. If you look at Brian Close in those pictures, he looks a little bit younger as well. So that was against Wes Hall. But that pitch, easy, was just not a very good pitch. Right. And I was talking about the regulations that were brought in recently about two, far, two fast bouncing balls above shoulder height. None of those balls were above shoulder height, so it wouldn't have meant anything. Right, Mikey. Now I've got to touch on something which is a controversial moment of your career. Yeah. Kicking over the stumps in New Zealand. Yeah, we can't only talk about the good. We have to no, talk about the bad to, as we've well. We've got to balance that a little bit. Tell yeah. us that we've got the footage of that as well. Tell us the story about that. Well, it was just a frustrating tour, Easy. You know, we were in New Zealand after beating Australia in Australia for the very first time. Very first time a West Indies team had beaten Australia in Australia. We went down there without Big Richards. We still thought we could beat them comfortably in New Zealand. And things were just going totally against us with umpiring. And when this test match in Dunedin, when we thought we were definitely going to win this test match, even after the, the fiasco that had taken place the first three, three days, with the DJs on the radio saying, oh, Westies are a bunch of wingers, because we were complaining about the umpiring. And then that was Parker batting. He was the last recognized batsman in the New Zealand lineup. And I knew that if we got him out at that stage, the test match was over. And the umpire just refused to give him out. You can see there from the pictures, his gloves are off, his bat is under his arm, and he's looking in the direction of the pavilion because the pavilion is square in Dunedin. And he looked to see the umpire not moving, and he decided, oh, you ain't giving me out, I ain't moving. But then my right leg got out of control. <laughs> you know, it's okay to laugh about it now, and people will always laugh about it and will run jokes about it and whatever. It's not something you want to see on a cricket field. Nice. And thankfully, that's the only incident that I've had in my career where if they had match referees then, I would have started my commentating career a bit earlier. Yes, I think, I think you might have. OK, Mikey, um, I've got to just obviously touch on the, the, the World Series cricket. I mean, that was, that was something I know was very important in your life. Yeah. How good was that playing a World Series? It was excellent. It was the highest calibre of cricket I've ever played because it was a, pretty much 50 of the world's best cricketers playing together. You never had an easy game and everything was hard, everything was just rough. But I'm grateful not just for the standard of cricket that was played, but for the fact that it did occur because that is what brought me back into cricket. I had pretty much moved on because the amount of money that was being paid to test cricketers those days, here. It, I could not have made a living from it. I was not interested in county cricket. That's why I did not play county cricket until near the end of my career. And if I was going to make a living from cricket, what was being paid then was not going to work. That 75 76 tour of Australia went there for about four months, could have been killed with all that fast bowling balls missing past your head. <laughs> when I got home, I got 600. 600, where's the camera? 600 <laughs> US dollars. 600, that's all. <laughs> And then right. all of a sudden they think you're going to make a career out of that. Then Packer comes along and instead of paying you $600 for a tour, $25,000. They, they were playing Pakistan, West Indies that is. We were playing Pakistan in Trinidad when I got the call from Lloyd to say some people are going to come and talk to you about some private enterprise cricket, that's what they call it. So have a look and see what you think. I was at university, easy, but thankfully Mr. Packer came along and I'm very grateful to him that brought me back into test cricket, or brought me back into cricket, because I've enjoyed my career. We, we saw some footage there of, uh, of the West Indies boys in the coral clothing. We've searched yes. the archives all over the place. We just cannot find any footage of you in the, I'm no. going to call it pink clothing. <laughs> no, you won't find any of me. Unfortunately, I was injured for, for quite a bit of, of that tour. 
and I was not selected in the final limb for more than about two or three games. Every time I tried to come back at bowl and the, the right shoulder would just drop, I couldn't do anything about it. So I was doing more promotions than anything else. Right. If you could find some promotional shots of the advertising that we did for some of the sponsors, I won't name the sponsors, but one was a petrol station, one was a fast food giant. You'll find me dressed right. in those clothing doing the promotion because that's all I could do that, that year, doing a lot of promotions. And you're talking about the Westernies fast bowlers, you're, you're foursome, obviously in a group of four, but you in particular worked with a very special partner a lot of your career. Yeah, I, Andy Roberts. Yep. Um, both of us started our careers pretty much at the same time, not international careers, of course, because Andy was 12th man for the Combine Islands, as it was called those days, when I was 12th man for Jamaica. I think it might have been 1973 or 70, I think it might have been 73. I could possibly even have been 72 because I was still at school. And we sat together on that bench in Jamaica watching the game and we just grew a friendship. And of course, then when we got together in West, the West Indies team, the friendship blossomed. And believe me, he taught me so much about fast bowling, about assessing the opposition, assessing pitches, exactly what to do about what you want to try to do and that sort of thing. It's unbelievable. Andy Roberts hardly ever speaks. Yes. People see him on the field and his face is so set as if he wants to fight someone. But off the field, if you get to know him, he's a gentle soul. And he knows a lot about the game. And he certainly imparted a lot of that to me. Let's turn our attention to the modern quicks. I know there's a Dale Stain who excites yep. you a lot. What you've seen over the years. Fantastic fast bowler. I admire him greatly. And not just the fact that he has taken so many wickets, but for all the qualities that he has. He has pace, he has aggression, he has rhythm with his bowling, makes things so easy when he's running in. He moves the ball in both directions. Look, look at the aggression from the man and the enthusiasm. and <laughs> He just loves what he's doing. And fast bowling is not easy work. So when you can run in and enjoy what you're doing like that, with the amount of hard work that you have got to do, it just makes me feel good. I admire him greatly for all that he has done for South African cricket, for himself, for world cricket and for fast bowling. And uh, we've seen a lot of Rabada throughout this summer. Your thoughts of Rabada are very high. Definitely. I, I love Rabada as well. I love to see the way he goes about his cricket. I'm not too sure about getting into people's spaces and that sort of thing. And so, some of that, I think he's now slowly but surely realising that he doesn't have to go down that road. But his talents are there to be seen. He has aggression as well. He has pace. He makes things look easy. The Australians talk about his fast arm, which makes him bowl a lot quicker than people would think that he would bowl. And I think he has it all. He's a young man. He's strong. I think he's a lot stronger now than I was at his age. So I would hope that he will continue for many more years. What about, you've got a, a bit of some footage there of you having a chat to him, I think it was yesterday morning. What about that relationship you've got with him? How would you describe that? I have a good, very good relationship with KG. And when I, when I went upstairs, someone asked me what I was telling him. And they, they thought I was talking to him about his bowling. Had nothing to do with cricket. We were just talking. And that's the relationship that I have built with him. I was even surprised, Easy. The very first year I, I met Rabada, he came to me asking me something about his personal life. Again, had nothing to do with cricket to show you how, mu how much he had gravitated towards me that early. So I just, just thought to myself, if this young man has so much faith in me to bring this issue to me, who he has just met and doesn't know that well, I can open up to him and we can express ourselves to each other as much as we, we want. And I would hope that sort of relationship we have will never get spoiled and that we, it can blossom. I'll tell you one thing though, I was so upset with him in Port Elizabeth right. that I walked straight past him one morning on the ground and he was shocked. He shouted to me, sh shouted to me, Mikey, what happened? I said, KG, what happened? You don't know what happened? I was very disappointed with, with what took place yesterday. But as I said, he's a young man, he's learning, he has as far as I'm concerned, learn from that episode and we'll see the right Rabada on and off the field going forward. I just want to touch briefly. Now, we've got a bit of footage of, of some of the older players. I know you want to talk about some of the actions of some yes. of the older guys. We've just got a couple we're going to run in there. I mean, there's the Harold Larwood, for example. We're going a long way back. Yes, we're going, going back, right to, way back to the 20s. Going a long way back and coming right through Hazy. People, I hear people keep on talking about fast bowlers should not get side on because that creates problems. Look how side on that gentleman is. 
I never heard of him having a back problem. And he's not the only one. The, the others that will show, they were quick, they were running, got very side on, bowled extreme pace, did not get injured. So all this talk about modern day fast bowlers should not get fired up, side on, is detrimental to, the, to their back. I think that is total rubbish. If you get totally side on and rotate your entire body, how is that going to give you, give you any problems? And we have seen it from the 1920s right through in the, into the 2000s. They never had back problems. How come Clive Lloyd got it so right with you guys? Well, Clive Lloyd was a good man manager. That's one thing I can tell people. A lot of people say, oh, that team, anybody could have captained that team. No, absolutely no way. Clive Lloyd knew how to get the best out of his players because he knew how to man manage. He respected everyone and everyone respected him. I wouldn't tell you he was the most tactically astute captain around, but that did not matter because everyone would do whatever Clive Lloyd wanted and would run through a wall for him. And that was the important thing. West Indies, lots of islands, lots of personalities coming from different backgrounds, different islands. If you don't know how to stitch that all together, yep. you have problems. He knew. How good was Viv? Brilliant. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, the best batsman I've seen. Is he? Right. Oh, oh, definitely. Fast, slow, medium pace, swing, spin, whatever. He made runs throughout the world against every bowler he came across. And that is how I judge people who can do whatever their speciality is, away, home, and against everything they come against. And what about those guys? Do you still stay in touch with all those guys? Yeah, well, I, I speak to Andy on a regular basis. I'm on commentary and Andy will send me a text, a text message while, and I hear my phone, or I feel my phone buzzing in my pocket. And that's Andy. I see Viv every now and again. God greeted I'm in England. I think he lives in England now. So I see him in England regularly. I speak, speak to Desmond Haynes every, every now and again. There are different guys that you have more contact with, but we are all in contact with each other some way. Mikey, thank you. I've thoroughly enjoyed that. My pleasure, Easy. But most importantly, I hope you enjoyed it also at home. The great Michael Holding. There's a bit about his career and why he was so good. You make me feel so alive.